And transformation, probably one of the greatest examples of that is obviously the butterfly. And so this morning, yes, Jeff, that caterpillar has more hair than I do. <laughs> but transformation is all about a, a change uh, from the essential nature to a new nature. Transformation is also uh, the word translated transformed in the New Testament is also the word used to describe Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So it, it's extremely important that we realize that we're not talking about just a, a subtle hairdo change, for those of you who can change your hairdo. We're, we're talking, I'm, I'm hung up on hair this morning for some reason. <laughs> but it, it, it's more than that. And uh, I'm going to try to limit myself so I don't walk away from the camera side. I know this last time I preached that I was off the edges, so we'll try to do that. But listen, first of all, Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. But then again in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we have both sides of that. This is a significant change when we talk about transformation. And for you and I to become a disciple, to go from a starting place to a disciple, there is that decision, that choice. And I love this verse, and I read it this week again. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, we read this. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. You see, that's the decision you have to make. Mom can't make it for you. Grandma can't make it for you. In my situation, I had nobody to follow. My mom and dad were good folks. I learned right from wrong. But we didn't go to church, didn't have any kind of religious experience. And so it was my decision made in 1968, kneeling before a toilet, where I said, Jesus, if you are who you really are, I want you in my life. And every one of us has to make that choice. That's the decision that transforms you from the starting place to the disciple, to the follower. And it's more than just a follower. When you make the decision to become a disciple, when you make that choice to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, you also make the decision to become a pupil, to be taught to continue to learn. You know, there's a difference between teaching and learning. I learned this in, in Sunday school real quick. I can teach and teach and teach, but if people didn't want to learn, it didn't do any good. Like on Wednesday nights, you don't mind if I make an unabashed. <laughs> Wednesday nights, we're doing 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We got through all of two verses on Wednesday night. But we had a great time of learning, and it's, it's mutual learning. It's not just me standing and, and speaking. It's me interacting with you so that we can learn together. Significant portion of Scripture. And then Jeff, being Jeff, challenged us to memorize 1 Corinthians 15. Anybody know how many verses in 1 Corinthians 15? 58. That's Jeff. I haven't started, but I'm going to. We'll, we'll, do it to. we'll do it a duet. How's that? So this morning, we're going to talk about transformation. And we're going to talk about a, a disciple is transformed to show the world. And our scripture comes from Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Four. 
So John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Father God, we ask you now to take this time as we open this word that our hearts might hear not some speaker of the hour because he's hidden behind the cross, but might hear your Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us about how a disciple is transformed to show the world. And Father, I just ask for your blessing upon this time in this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. It says John came baptizing. We know a little about the history about John. John uh, was chosen from the time he was conceived to be a special person used by God. He was raised in a palace, in a man. No, wait a minute. No, he was raised by just ordinary folks. He was raised in a home of a priest. And John came and he fulfilled a prophecy, that prophecy of a voice calling in the wilderness, a voice calling in the desert. And that was his choice. That was his life's call. But it's interesting that he, he was clothed in camel hair. He ate honey and locusts. How many of God's messengers, how many of the people that God wants to use to spread his message are not noticed because they're not prominent, because they're not in a position of authority? Think about it. John, John was just an ordinary guy, but he was called by God for a purpose. He was called by God to fulfill this prophecy that had been made Centuries before. And by fulfilling that prophecy, he set the stage for the coming of the Messiah. It kind of struck me as I've, as I've looked at this, and, and, and Jeff uh, asked me a month or two ago to, to do this, and, I've, and I've, uh, I've done the typical preacher thing, right? I was still changing the message this morning. But as I looked at this, I thought to myself, God uses people like us. I used to sit right there in the pew. I, I talked about 50 years of work clothes. For 25 years, I sat in the pew. For 25 years, I, I worked in the corporate world. And I was blessed to have the opportunity to teach Sunday school. I, I think back that we hadn't been married very long. We had gone to Endicott, New York for school. We came back to Topeka, Kansas, and we, we got connected with the church, and we were teaching the teens. Anybody that works with teens, I praise you greatly. <laughs> they were a great bunch of teens, and, and they had started building a replica of the tabernacle. What a challenge. But I understand that, that God uses people like us, God uses people like you to accomplish what only you can accomplish. Why? Because he's uniquely created you for that purpose. You are uniquely created by God to carry out his task. 
Maybe it's to preach. Maybe it's to teach. Maybe it's to pray. Maybe it's to make phone calls and encourage people. You know, in this day and age, especially through what we've just come through and we continue to go through, picking up the phone and calling somebody and saying, hey, are you okay? Just listening. That's one of the skills that, that, that God has helped me with is the fact that you just need to, you know, excuse the expression, we didn't use this at home, but just shut up and listen. <laughs> That's part of what God has called us to do. So if, if you're sitting there, and, and as, I, as I watched Phil and myself, we brought a little maturity to the service today, uh, there is no retirement planning with God. You may quit going to your corporate job, but God says there is no retirement. I can continue to use you to be a disciple, to reach people, to show the world. John didn't have any, any hope, any desire to be anything but what he was. Listen to what he said in John chapter 1. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. He, he didn't have any desire to be the guy. He didn't have any desire to do anything but what God called him. And what I have found, that when God calls you, he empowers you. And that's the way it was with John. John was kind of like the prevenient grace that we talk about as, as Nazarenes. That grace that goes before that's, that was John's job. He was setting the stage. He was preparing. He wanted that. And his repentance was, his baptism was a repentance of sin. And I loved, where's Nick? Nick Eddy, when he preached, I was here, and he talked about repentance. And it's an ongoing thing. We get so hung up on the idea that, well, repentance is for this huge Sin that we've committed, this, this disobedience and no will of God. No, repentance is the idea that we go to God and say, hey, God, how did I do today? Is there anything in my life that you need me to change? And you see, repentance leads to confession because once you begin to repent, you, there may be something in your life that you need to tell God, yeah, I guess I did mess up there when I said these words to so-and-so. But then that confession, what does it do? It brings Repentance. And so this morning, I would challenge you that you don't make a negative out of repentance. That you make it a positive. Stand before God. I had a, a, a young man in my congregation. He used to tell me that every morning, he'd put his feet out on the floor, and he'd tell God, here I am. However you need to use me today, God, and Harold was 78 years old when I moved here from Colorado. But that was his, that was his motto. That was the way he woke up every day. And, and so when Paul, when, when Mark talks about John the baptizer being out there at the Jordan River and, and baptizing and people were coming, and I, I want you to notice that it says all of Judean, Countryside. When you start talking about Jesus, when you start sharing about Christ and what Christ has done in your life, you will draw all people to him, not to you. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. That's our job. As a Disciple that has been transformed, it's our job to show the world. It's our job to reveal Christ to others. And, and so we've got John the Baptist out there, and he's drawing all these people. And then this guy just shows up. You know? A family member of all things. A cousin. And this cousin has come... And he wants John to baptize him for the repentance of sin. The problem is that when John was in the womb, 
He recognized that his cousin was special. He recognized that Jesus was special. And John says, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> he says, I shouldn't be baptizing you. Listen to how Matthew records that in chapter 3. He says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do, you, and do not come to me. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all the righteousness. Then John consented. So why was the sinless Son of God baptized? Because it was the right thing to do at that time. To fulfill the, 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 the rules of that day. Jesus tells us that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And one of the ways to fulfill the law at that time, one of the ways to fulfill that time was to be baptized for the repentance of sin. Except that Jesus had no sin to repent of, but still he needed and wanted to fulfill it. At the same time, he was acknowledging what John was preaching in his baptism, repent, Jesus showed his agreement. You know, it's one thing to give mouth service to something. Don't talk the talk unless you're willing to walk the walk. And that's what Jesus was doing. It was one thing to say, yeah, John, you're doing the right thing and, and being baptized for the repentance of sin is the thing to do. But he put, Jesus put his seal of approval on this, what John was doing. He, he put the seal of approval on how John was baptizing, why John was baptizing. And that is why Jesus came to John in the Jordan and why he did what he did. And the other thing that happened, that as Jesus came up out of the water, it, it says that the sky was torn apart. I love that picture. I, I love the idea of torn apart. It wasn't just a, 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 a little light. It was this huge show. And that everybody, do you realize that everybody was at the Jordan that day, heard the voice? You are my son in whom I am well pleased. There was this beginning to show that. And so what about our baptism? Well, first off, if you claim to be a disciple, you ought to have been baptized at some point. If you look at the New Testament record, every time you see a decision to be a follower, to be a disciple of Jesus, there is an immediate baptism that follows. Now, I realize that that's not necessarily, your water trough is not just set up all the time. I understand that. In my situation, on June the 1st of 1968, and I think I've shared this story with you, my mother-in-law confronted me about being selfish and convicted my heart. The Holy Spirit took that and convicted me. And I went into that toilet and I knelt down beside it and I said, Jesus, if you are who you are, I want you in my life. I immediately called the pastor of the church that, that Sarah's uh, family attended, that I had been attending, and told him about my decision. He came and talked to me. And the very next day, because in their situation, their baptistry was always ready for baptism. And that day, I made a public confession of my faith in a risen Christ and was baptized. Did baptism save me? Absolutely not. Did that water wash away my sin? Absolutely not. It takes the blood shed by the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away your sins. What that baptism did that day was 
an outward sign, an outward demonstration of the beginning of an inward work in my life. That's what our baptism is. It is you and I making a statement, showing the world that we're being transformed. And that transformation is from the, the inside out. Dr. Luke, writing in Acts, talks about the fact that we're baptized into Christ. He says this in chapter 8, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes when you're baptized into Christ. We need to understand, and we need to be challenged, that when we are a disciple that is transformed to show the world that we have a responsibility. We need to take care of our salvation. Now, I was thinking, I have been a, a, a Christian for a while. I don't even think Moby Dick was a minnow when I got saved. Wow. How long ago? Well, we've been married 52 years. So it's been a little over 52 years. And I've, I began to realize that if I didn't take care of my salvation, if I didn't take care of my spiritual well-being, nobody else was. As much as Jeff wants to make you well spiritually, he can't. As much as I and my 25 years of pastoral ministry want to make every person I ever met well spiritually, I can't. Your spiritual well-being depends on you. Your spiritual well-being, your transformation as a disciple depends on you. As a transformed disciple, your first step is to follow Christ. Well, you say, well, Dennis, how do I follow Christ? I'm glad you asked. Jeff told you last week that for 18 years or 17 years, I challenged my congregation to read the Bible through completely in a year. This is the Discipleship Journal Bible Reading Plan. It's free. I've used it now 18 years. If you're looking for something to help you, if you're a box checker like me, this is your plan. The nice thing about it is that it gives you four readings each day. Old Testament, New Testament, Gospels, Psalms, or Proverbs. The neat part about this program is that it's only 25 days a month. So if you somehow get behind, one of the things I had people tell me was, well, well Dennis, I, I, I missed a few days, and so I just kind of gave up. Well, this one here, you can miss five or six days and still catch up. Now, I realize this is the 10th. <laughs> and maybe you say, well, I don't want to start this year. Fine. I, I'd encourage you. And, and people say, well, why do I have to read the whole Bible? I can just read some of it. You can't get what God's telling you by reading part of the Bible. I know people who say, well, we don't need the Old Testament because we got the New Testament. You can't understand the New Testament unless you read the Old Testament. Because from Genesis to Revelation, it's one subject. That's it. Just one. Christ. And if you don't think so, ask Jeff. He'll show you in the Old Testament. He's shown us in the Old Testament. Throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, is Christ. And so I challenge you, if you've not done it before, to do it. Just once. I, uh, when I started my, my ministry in Wichita, I, I started, and every year on the first Sunday of January, I'd give those who read the Bible through that year, a little card that I made up. 
Well, nothing fancy, just, just kind of, and, and the, I think the first year I had 17 or 18. The last year I was in ministry, I had two. And you say, well, if they did it once, why do it? Because you need to be fed. And the word of God is your food. And you can't get enough food from hearing Jeff on Sunday morning. You need to be fed regularly. And so a transformed disciple follows Jesus. He, he knows what Jesus does. She knows how to, to walk like Jesus. She knows when she's not walking like Jesus and she gets convicted and she repents and she turns back and walks like Jesus. A transformed disciple is ever growing in Christ likeness. I shared this example on Wednesday night. If you're not growing spiritually, you're dying. The first time I used that, that statement in one of my assignments, I had somebody come up to me and say, show me in Scripture where it says that. I can't. But I can show you lives that prove it. I can show you lives that quit growing spiritually, quit growing into Christ's likeness, and they, they drifted away. And I can't remember the author. I, 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 I'm not even going to say because I don't remember exactly who it was that I read, but he gave the example of a Christian life is like swimming up river. What happens when you stop swimming? You go the other way. You drift from God. You got to keep swimming. And, and as, a, as a new Christian, man, you jump. You, you are just growing and growing and growing and growing. But then as you mature, as you, as you grow in Christ's likeness, the, the, the changes, the growth are not as significant. And what I have found that in the growth, as, as you are a transformed disciple, the growth in Christ's likeness is more in attitudes. It's more in the, the little things because, because the Holy Spirit has already led you into the, into the big things. Attitudes, you know, they're, they're one of those things that, that control us and we don't really understand it. I have an attitude about ice cream. It's chocolate only. Yeah, if your attitude towards ice cream is chocolate, you're in trouble. But at the same time, you kind of like vanilla. You know? A transformed disciple looks at his attitudes and she, she begins to, to look at him well. A transformed disciple is baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have come to that point in their lives where they acknowledge that they can't do it on their own. They acknowledge that they don't have the power to live the spiritual life that Christ calls them to live. Mine happened under a grand piano at Fairlawn Church of the Nazarene, where I recognized that I was trying to do this spiritual Christ-like thing on my own strength, my own power. And I realized that I couldn't. And so I turned to our associate pastor, Clarence, and said, Clarence, pray for me. And he said, Dennis, I have been. And it was at that altar that I gave it all to God. A transformed disciple who is now spirit-filled, spirit-controlled. And as a transformed disciple, that's what we want. 
because we realize it's impossible to do this Christian life on our own power, on our own strength. Because the enemy is out there just waiting for you to try it. If you think you can be a self-sufficient Christian, I have terrible news for you right now. You can't. And if you think, and I understand this whole COVID thing. We, we've been there, done that. We need each other. Scripture is clear. Steel, sharpen steel. We need to be together. We, we, we need to be part of the family. I am blessed right now. I am so beyond blessed, I can't tell you. I have almost my whole immediate and extended family within 17 miles of me. And Nana, that's her over there, Nana has decided that we need to do Sunday night Nana dinners. Unless you're prepared, don't plan on coming to dinner at Nana's Sunday night dinners. We have a very rambunctious group, to say the least. And every topic is free game. But you know there's something about that family. There's something about knowing that I can call Dan, who's a mile and a half away, and say, hey, Dan, I need, I need some help with moving some wood. Or I can call Jeff and say, hey, Jeff, I need some help with this, and, and know that they'll be there. It's the same in the Christian walk. A transformed disciple needs to realize that it takes the power of an indwelling Holy Spirit to live the life that needs to be lived. And if you're trying to do it on your own, stop. I know, our world has said for years now, if you can't do it on your own, you're just not worth anything. Fooey. Vernon Wright used to sit right here where Jack is. And Vernon and I agreed that fooey was a theological word. <laughs> you can't. You just can't do it on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the body of Christ to come and lift you up. We need each other. Reuben Welch, a, a great theologian teacher at Point Loma Nazarene University, uh, wrote a book. And it talks about we really do need each other. And in that book, he describes a time, one of his classes, and I don't know where this hill is in San Diego, but there is a hill in San Diego where you could walk to the top. Well, one of his classes decided that they were going to do that. And there was some younger people, and there was this, you know, this guy that had been a Marine, and there been there were several of them, and they start out. And all of a sudden, they're spread throughout this whole climb. And some of them get to the top and they're all excited and rejoicing. And then it hits them. What about the rest? What about those that, that are struggling? What about So they came back down the hill and they sat together and they agreed, we really do need each other. And so the next Saturday, they're all at the foot of this hill again. And they all, the whole class, up the hill together. You and I really need each other. Because the world needs to see us as a disciple that's transformed. So the question becomes, how do you a transformed disciple show the world. Well, first of all, you show the world by being baptized. You say, well, wait a minute, Dennis. That's just the people in the church. What a great place to start. What a great place to start. Baptism services were one of the 
the most significant points in my ministry. I never got to the horse trough. I wish I would have gotten to know Jeff sooner, but we didn't have a baptistry, so we, we used the pouring method. And the people were just as baptized as those who were immersed because they testified that Jesus had died and rose again, and they believed by faith that he was in. So if you're going to show the world as a transformed disciple, then you're going to be baptized. If you're going to show the world as a transformed disciple, you're going to be obedient to God. Again, that goes back to the Word. You need to be in the Word. You need to know what God expects you to do. You need to know what God expects you not to do. But a transformed disciple showing the world is obedient to God. A transformed disciple shows the world by our reactions. This is, this is one of those things that's so critical. The way you react is who you are. Hear me. The way you react is who you are. The way you come into this room on a Sunday morning and act may not be who you are. Don't get me wrong, it may be, but, but the true measure of an individual, the true understanding of who a person is, is how you react. And I'll tell you, this week I, I had all kinds of reactions. Jeff has alluded to it. I was disgusted, I was hurt, and I was somewhat angry. This is one nation under God. And we acted like a nation of heathens. Some did. But you want to know how your transformation as a disciple is going? Check your reaction the next time. And see how you react. And finally, we show the world as a transformed disciple by our complete surrender to God. Absolute, no holding back. You know, for me, it was, it was easy to give up the, the cars and the house. But what about the family? What, what, what about the job? What, what about the grandkids? What, what about all of that? And I think it, it really struck home. We were living in Lafayette, Colorado. Uh, I had driven a little red Nissan pickup for years on a lease. And just in, in April, the lease was almost up, so I traded it for another little red Nissan pickup. Well, lo and behold, that July, I left that corporate life to start Nazarene Bible College. And my oldest son, David, took this almost brand new red Nissan pickup to work. And he came home and he, he came in the house and he says, oh, dad, dad, I'm so sorry. I says, what's the matter, son? He said, come look. Somebody had keyed, taken a key and scratched the hood of that almost brand new red Nissan pickup. And all of a sudden, I looked at David and I said, David, this is four wheels and sheet metal that gets me 100 miles back and forth to the Bible college. That's all it is. That was my reaction. Now, I'll guarantee you, years before, that would not have been my reaction. But at that moment, I realized that somebody else was in control of my life. And today, I ask you, as a disciple being transformed to show the world, are you letting God be God in your life? Pray with me.